Hey, Johnny Lippiet here again, coming at you from Brooklyn for lesson number two in my exciting instalment of internet video saxophone education, right? For all you sonic sorcerers and audio alchemists, because I thought what we need is more videos about saxophone education on the internet, because there's hardly anything out there. Not. However, too much of a good thing? I don't think so. You can never have too much of a good thing, right? So the more people making videos about how to play the saxophone, it's awesome. It helps to put colour and rainbows in this dark, miserable world that we seem to be existing in at the moment. Now, it's not always dark and miserable, but uh, living in America at the moment, it's um, somewhat vicissitudinal, shall we say. And having just returned from England, the woes and miseries of Brexit are somewhat depressing. So music, as we know, is a wonderful way to escape all that dreary nonsense and elevate our souls to a higher realm. What I wanted to talk about in this video was the Overtone series. Now I know it's something probably you all know loads about, but maybe some of you don't know hardly anything about. And it's one of those things that we're only ever in the middle with music, aren't we? There's no right, there's no wrong, um, no matter where we are we've always got plenty more to learn. There's always people better, there's always better than others. So it's not a competition. As Bartok said, competitions are for horses, not for musicians. So maybe there's some gems of wisdom here that I can share with you and you might get something out of it and find it somewhat inspirational and it might help you on your journey um, just as the th things that have helped me on my journey and continue to help me. So overtone series right now we know that when we play a low b flat on the saxophone every single button on the saxophone is closed right so all we're dealing with is a big tube of brass that's vibrating now the first overtone that comes off that is then the second sound overly exciting to listen to but one good exercise is to practice this tone matching thing and a great book to check out if you haven't got it is Dave Liebman developing a personal saxophone sound because he goes into great depth um, about how it all works um, but the tone matching exercise is where we try to get the regular fingerings on the saxophone to sound like the notes that come off the overtone so if we were to play a middle B flat for example I'm just using the bis fingering here getting used to that being played by fingering a low B flat and then the F and the B flat and the D fingering the low B flat but sounding the overtones off them and matching them with the regular fingerings. It's called tone matching. I'm sure you've all done plenty of it already. Um, there's no right or wrong way to do this. The right way is the way that's right for you. Um, but what I wanted to talk a bit about today was using what are called short overtone fingerings because maybe some of you don't know about this concept which is understanding that in the second octave of the saxophone, notes overblow in a fifth. Okay, so if we were to play the high B flat with the octave key, now we could get that note by playing the low B flat, and then we get the third overtone off that. We can also get that B flat by playing a middle E flat. We're just fingering a fifth below. So if we play an A, we can get that from a fifth below. And when we start on a middle D of the horn and overblow the horn in fifths, we can actually go up the whole horn sounding 
those overtones. Now they're kind of fake overtones in a way because they're not coming off the fundamental, but they're much more useful to incorporate into improvisations because then we're not trying to get our little pinky down on that, that spatula key onto the low B flat and the low B. Um, and an interesting thing I heard years ago that got me interested in this was the classic Michael Brecker lick that I'm sure you've all heard because he was a master of everything to do with the saxophone, really. Um, he would play this lick. Now I'd hear dee dun do da dee da and I could hear that second note was an overtone. But I'd be like, dee, how would he be getting down to the low? It just seemed like a lot of hard work to get down to the low B flat to get back. But then I worked out that he was only actually playing the G. He was playing a G with the octave key and overblowing it a fifth. I was like, aha, interesting. And then I think I heard him play a lick that was something along the lines of. Or something, which was the same path, which was going D and then making that D sound again by playing the G and then getting the E to sound by playing the A. So if we were to play that with traditional fingerings, all it would be was which is side D, side E, D, 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 E, D. But he was getting those from the short fingerings. Then taking it down a semitone and down a semitone again. I mean, it really does sound wonderful, doesn't it? And the neighbours, I think, are particularly endeared by this kind of practice coming from the apartment next door. However, what are we going to do? You know, we've got to get better at the saxophone. This is the stuff we need to practice. So it was always very interesting to me to realise that we could get these overtones by overblowing a fifth. And another interesting technique is if you take um, a lick, it could be, could be anything. Let's just start on a middle D and play but now we're going to overblow that by a fifth Sorry. can you see what i'm doing with those i'm overblowing each one by a fifth sometimes quite hard the throat really has to work and it really has to open up and there's plenty of mistakes in here i could keep trying to record it till it was perfect but we're not perfect we're all just human so i'm happy to put this out there with all kinds of errors because i am a mere novice and beginner myself and the further we wade into the ocean of musicality the deeper the waters get and there are no shortage of people splashing around in the shallows up to their knees proclaiming they know everything there is to know about the ocean but we know that's far from the truth and the further we wade out the deeper it is so um, learning these short fingerings can be quite helpful um, so again just to recap starting start D is a good one to start on so we're going to play a middle D just overblow it so we sound the A a fifth above it now you can see I'm not moving my fingers, I'm just using the fact that the saxophone wants to overblow in a fifth. If we move up a semitone to E flat, same thing, just overblowing in a fifth. If we play an E, Going up again, F. Now some of these are harder than others and some really don't want to pop out at all. Um, so we, we have to work with them and the ones that are particularly hard are the ones we need to spend the most time with. I find C sharp quite challenging, which is where we're going to get that coming off the F sharp, a fifth below. So here's the F sharp. And here's the fifth above it. Then G. That's 
that's where I kind of run into difficulties myself. When I get to that high C, it doesn't really want to overblow a fifth to the G. I think a B is about as high as, for me anyway, that I can utilise. So, um, and so it's, it's worth practising and it was interesting to be able to get my head around when I heard Brecker playing those kind of lines how he was being able to get those overtones sounding without always having to get down to the low fundamentals. So to recap, if we're playing a high C, yes, we can get that note from playing the low C and getting that high C to sound. But we can also get it from playing the F, a fifth below. sounding thing is almost as exciting to listen to as somebody practicing on the mouthpiece on its own which we know is another great thing to do uh, for practice which is nice but while I'm on the subject because I can wax lyrical about anything and I'll go off on these tangents there was a nice thing I saw of Jerry Bagonzi who we know is just one of the greatest greatest saxophone players in the world not only a great saxophone player a beautiful human being and he was talking about something about trying to take the horn and the neck just off like that. And just on this, trying to make it sound as much like a saxophone as we could. OK, now, you know, when we just play this, it's not going to sound particularly nice. But the more we work on that, we can really try and work on the tone alone. And I always found that a little nicer to listen to for my own ears than the mouthpiece alone, which we know is another great exercise, but I find I get neighbours banging on the door when I do that. But just by practising on the neck, it can help to get that larynx thing going. And it's by getting the larynx opening and closing that we can really get those bends on the horn. Another Brecker thing you'd hear him do a lot was that... a. opening the vocal cavity um, to get the note to drop right down. It is a wonderful technique and very, very useful when we're practicing these short fingerings. So you can, there's any number of permutations. We could go up in whole steps. <laughs> possibilities and I guess it's up to you to find which ones work good for you which ones you like the sound of um, another very good exercise on the overtone series I'm sure you all know it already but it's um, a good one for helping to develop sound is playing scales in overtones again Liebman talks about this in his book which is um, written really really well and if you haven't got a copy of developing a personal saxophone sound by David Liebman it is one that is highly recommended for your library or just listen to players who are doing it and figure it out. Some people like to learn out of books. Other people like to learn off the records. We live in a wonderful time where there's opportunity to have both, right? Every album that was ever recorded we can get online now. And there's just a wealth of information in printed matter too. But so playing scales in overtones, if we took, say, a B flat scale and we just played it normally... <laughs> Now we know that we can play that 
in overtone. So the first B flat I play, middle B flat, I'm going to finger a low B flat. Now the next note would be C, but I'm going to get the middle C by playing a low C. Overblow the D by an octave. Same with the E flat. But the F is coming off a low B flat. The G is going to come off a C. The A comes off the D, overblowing the fifth like we were talking about. And the B flat can come off the low B flat. Or off the E flat. So there's three ways that we can play that high B flat. Off the E flat or off the low B flat or regular fingering. So hopefully this might have been of some use to somebody somewhere. Maybe not. It, it, I don't know. Um, but it gives me pleasure to share this with you. And hopefully when you next hear Brecker playing that classic lick that I think he played quite a lot actually. Uh, he's not grabbing that low B flat to get the D, he's sounding that high D off a G and overblowing the horn by a fifth. And um, like I say, when you'd heard him play those lines where he would play what seemed like a normal line in terms of fingering, but it was sounding like an overtone, again, he was just playing it on a fingering, um, like, that's just D, E, F, G, A but overblow it by a fifth. Okay, so hopefully that makes some sense. All the records have the answers on them. It's a relatively new-ish technique. I don't think um, like the super old school players particularly had a had a grasp of the overtone series. I think it was quite prevalent in the classical world. Obviously, Sigurd Rascher was very mindful of the overtone series. But I've spoken to some great saxophone players who have no concept of it and no awareness and could, couldn't even play an overtone series on the saxophone. But yet they have some of the greatest sounds ever. But they have that because they were just great players with fantastic air streams. But I find it a very useful thing to practice. I find it a useful way of developing sound, um, a great way to get around the horn, and much like playing multiphonics, they really sort of help the sound in general. I always find if I'm practicing multiphonics like if I seem to do that for a few minutes, it feels like when I play normal notes they seem to be just a bit fuller and that's what I like about the overtone series it helps me to fill out that sound especially up the high top of the horn um, we know sometimes the notes can get a bit thin up there so taking a high F and being able to play that by fingering a low B flat short fingering we know we can cheat and play it off a B flat a fifth below right so there you go hopefully that's been of some help and that's been of some use to you and um, if you like this video click like subscribe to my channel I'm going to try and put loads of videos up of me just talking about anything that particularly inspires me um, as I say, there's no shortage of stuff on the internet, but the more people that are putting stuff on there, the better, because we can never have too many saxophone players. Uh, there's certainly no gigs really anymore, but um, at least the more people that are playing saxophone and helping to put some sunshine in the world, it's a beautiful thing. So thank you very much for watching. My name's Johnny Lippiot, coming at you from Brooklyn, New York, and stay tuned for installment three. Thank you, and hasta la vista.